right, everyone, welcome to the first EEX colloquium for the semester. Just on the off chance that you have an empty seat next to you, would you raise your hand? There's one. So someone take that seat in, in the front. Excellent. Thank you for, uh, for coming in such great numbers today. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce Maria Klawe, who um, is the fifth president of Harvey Mudd College. She began her tenure there in 2006, and she's the first woman to lead the college since it was founded in 1955. Um, she's had a long uh, career in computer science uh, at other universities before that. So before Harvey Mudd, she served as the Dean of Engineering and a Professor of Computer Science at Princeton University. Before Princeton, she was at uh, UBC, IBM Research, and the University of Toronto. She received her PhD and her Bachelor's in Science and Mathematics from the University of Alberta. Uh, Maria has made significant research contributions in a wide number of areas in computer science and mathematics, ranging from functional analysis, discrete mathematics, theoretical computer science, to human-computer interaction and interactive multimedia. She has uh, many other acclaims, and so I will just give you some highlights. Um, Maria uh, is one of the ten members of the board of Microsoft. She's also a board member of Broadcom, a uh, trustee for the <laughs> Mathematical Sciences Research Institute here in Berkeley, and she's the co-chair of the Scientific Advisory Board of the Simons Institute here at UC Berkeley. Now, one thing that um, I'm especially interested to hear about today in, in her talk is how she and her colleagues at Harvey Mudd managed uh, a really dramatic increase in uh, women's representation in computing. In the span of just five years, they went from uh, uh, engagement of 12% of women in CS to over 40%. And so this is really outstanding. Um, please help me give a warm welcome to Maria Klawe. Thanks, Bjorn. How's that? Better? OK, well, I just said that I'm no longer co-chair of the Simons uh, Scientific Advisory uh, committee, and I'm also actually much more recently no longer on the board of Microsoft. I went off at the beginning of December, and I may say something a, a, a little bit of the reason why as I get further on. So I have a few of my paintings interspersed <laughs> in this. I started doing this some time ago. I paint all the time, and uh, most of what you'll see here is um, portraits. I do a lot of portraits of children, and. Uh, all of the portraits of children I'm going to show you are the children of leaders in CS one way, and math, one way or another. OK. Um, so I'm going to talk about getting more females into tech careers. And this is something I've been very passionate about for my whole life. I'm 64, which is a great age for a computer scientist. <laughs> and, and on my birthday, I got all of these emails about, you know, Will you still love me, <laughs> et cetera? And will you still feed me? And, and people were assuring me they would still love me and feed me, even though I'm 64 now. Um, so, but that means that when I started my undergraduate work as a math major at the University of Alberta, there were very few female math majors, or graduate students, or faculty for that matter. And in fact, my entire time as both an undergraduate and a graduate student at the University of Alberta, I had one course taught by a female professor and she was a visiting faculty member. Um, so you know, one of the things that would happen was I would hear constantly, Maria, why do you want to be a mathematician? There are no good female mathematicians. Now, I was really good at mathematics. And they knew I was really good at mathematics. So that wasn't what this conversation was about. It was about, you're incredibly talented. You could do anything. Why would you pick a discipline where you're going to have all of these challenges just because you're female? And so very early on in my life, I decided that I wanted to change the culture, initially of mathematics, then more broadly of science and engineering, so that it would embrace everybody who brought passion, hard work, and talent, independent of gender or race or any other irrelevant thing. And so I actually did my first outreach to girls about math when I was 17 years old on a TV show. 
Um, so why do I care about getting more women to tech? Um, okay, this is this painting at the bottom is called Sasha's World, and my daughter, who's now 30, but a few years ago, she said, "Mom." My friend Colleen was able to buy this antique map for $200, and I can't afford it. So would you paint me a map of the world? <laughs> OK, this is like 150 hours of my time. <laughs> $200. I should have just paid the $200. OK, okay why does it matter? First of all, um, you know, we read everywhere about the fact that there are, there's more need for computer science graduates than there is supply in this country, and that's true of many countries. The second one is, at least my experience is, that a career related to tech is just a great career. There are opportunities to make a difference in the world. It pays well. There's a lot of flexibility. So if, like me, you wanted to have children and be married as well as have an ambitious career, there's a great thing for that. And I think everybody should have an opportunity to have access to those careers. But you know, the most important one is there's lots of research that shows that if you have more diverse teams, they find better solutions. And you know, we all know about the problems that f face the world today, and it's going to get worse. And you know, I want the most diverse teams working on solving those problems. Now, computer science is by no means the only solution to those problems. But it's involved in virtually every one of them, whether it's better vaccines, better education, uh, even peace negotiations, which is what my daughter Sasha now does in Africa. Um, you, you know, one of the things she says, Mom, you know, lawyers are just hopeless with technology. <laughs> and I'm going, yeah. And so <laughs> she decides she sees this interactive website. That she, and she wants to make one of them that communicates better how international law affects peace negotiations. And, and she says, so this is last March, she sends me and my son an email and, and says, uh, how long would it take me to learn how to make a website like this? I know I'd have to learn to program. And I said, I think Yannick should answer. He does information security for Square in New York City. Because he has, I've never made a website in my life, let me be honest. And um, so he writes back, he says about half a day. <laughs> you have to learn some JavaScript and CSS. And she writes back and says, will you teach me? I've been trying. She was 30 years old at this point. I've been trying to get her to learn to code since she was 12. <laughs> you know, clearly, you know, the strategy for getting more women engaged in computer science is to show that they can do things with it that will achieve their goals. OK. Uh, so change is needed at all levels. And I know I'm preaching to the choir here. I, I had an opportunity to talk with several people before this talk and hear about the progress that uh, Berkeley is making in terms of increasing the number of women in CS major. It's an all-time high, I believe, or at least for now, uh, for the last, let's say, 20 years, it's high of 26%, which is great. Um, so we need to do that. We need to increase the hiring and retention of women in the tech industry. And one of the things we know is that women are twice as likely to leave within the first seven to 10 years leave a technical job and go on to something else than white males. We need to increase the hiring retention of women in academia. And we need to increase the promotion of women at highest levels of leadership in the industry and academia. And one of the things that's really depressing is we're making so little progress, both in terms of presidents and chancellors are, who are female. We're still at the same percentage that we were at uh, in 2000. And the same kind of thing for women executives in the tech industry and other industries, and for women on corporate boards. So here is my hypothesis. If we make learning and work environments interesting and supportive, if we build confidence and community among women, and if we demystify success, women will come, thrive, and stay. So I think the first two are pretty obvious, but let me say something about the third one. If you're a mem member of the dominant group, whether it's, so which for the tech industry is largely white and Asian males, you are part of a network. And you're not even aware of the fact that you have access to information that people who are not in the dominant group don't. And it's not because anyone's trying to be nasty to the people who aren't in the dominant group. It's just you're not part of the group that's going out to play video games or 
drink beer or whatever. And there's a natural information flow that goes with social groups. So, and in most places, particularly in industry, it's really not so clear what makes you more successful. And, you know, I gave this a, a version of this talk to uh, about 100 uh, women and men, but mostly women, technical women at Microsoft. And when I put this slide up, you know, afterwards everyone came up and they said, you're not allowed to talk about how you become successful. I mean, it's just not part of what the conversation is. So I think we need to make that conversation open. So I'll just uh, tell you a very quick story. I gave a very similar talk to the one I'm going to give today um, to a conference called HR50, which invites uh, the chief human resources officer from 50 big multinational companies. And after I gave the talk, the chief HR officer, Alan Chuk from Accenture, came up and said, wow, I'm going to take the ideas from your talk and I'm going to implement them at Accenture. I saw her four months, four months later. And she said, i got to tell you what happened. So she said, you know, every year we recruit 17,000 engineers in India. And we've been coming in at 30%. And we think that's pretty good, which it is compared to you know, Microsoft or Google or Facebook or whatever. She said, but I set the team a goal of 45% this year. And we only changed three things. We changed the way we just, we changed, we rewrote the job descriptions so that we emphasized creative problem solving, working on teams, communication skills, et cetera, as well as all the technical things that were there before. We changed the interview process to make it much less advers adversarial. And we went and we also recruited at women's colleges of engineering in India. And we came in at 43%, up from 30%. So it didn't cost any more money, wasn't difficult, and it worked. So if anyone tells you that you can't change these things, that it's hard to change them, don't believe them. OK, what can we do? So we can do fun and interesting CS and engineering courses in middle school and high school. We can change the way we teach computer science and engineering at the college level. In my mind, I mean, of course, I'm invested in teaching at the undergraduate level. That's what Harvey Mudd does. But I think that's actually one of the easiest things to do. We can learn how to recruit and retain more female faculty. Again, not terribly hard, but, you know, We've, for the last eight years, have been educating every search committee, faculty search committee, on best practices for recruiting a diverse pool, for how to interview them so that they'll have a good experience rather than a sometimes crappy experience, and um, on how to negotiate so that you're likely to land them. Learn how to recruit and retain more females in the tech industry. Create and support networking and mentoring opportunities for females at all levels increase the visibility of the issues. And um, for those of us who are female, um, be willing to take risks and lean forward in our careers. So. You're missing advocates along the way. Just a, a uh, you'll get there. We'll get, we'll get there. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'll add that. Um, and so one of the things that many people don't realize is that Computer science is the only STEM discipline where the female percentage of majors has declined in the last 30 years from more than 30% to less than 15%. Uh, now, it's always complicated looking at um, numbers for gender participation because the federal numbers are always somewhat different from the Toby survey numbers, which surveys PhD granting computer science departments. And one of the problems is the federal category includes some areas like management information systems or just information sciences. Information sciences is most places actually library science. And so it mixes, whereas the Tolby survey, um, I, I have a lot more faith in. So I'm using numbers from Tolby here. Um, I often get told when I talk about, you know, there not being a lot of women in CS, they'll say, well, it's because girls are not good at math. <laughs> Excuse me? You know, for at least 20 years, a, 44 to 45% of the math majors have been female. 
Um, I, I think everyone in this room knows that CS graduates have the best job prospects, and we expect it to continue for the next two decades. Um, and uh, there are a lot of different kinds of institutions that have made a lot of progress. So Carnegie Mellon and UBC were the first. Carnegie Mellon started in the mid-90s. We started maybe a year after them. Um, private institutions and public institutions, as you know well at Berkeley, have very different constraints on them. Um, it's much harder to do it at large public research institutions for a whole variety of reasons. But Carnegie Mellon went from under 10% to almost 40% over about a five-year period. UBC from 16% to 27% over a five-year period. They're now a bit over 30. MIT from 20 to 32% over about a six-year period, a little bit later than CMU and UBC. Harvey Mudd from 10% to 40%. We're now around 45%. Uh, Cal Poly Slow, now there's an institution that has a lot of constraints on it. They admit to a major. They're not allowed to try and get students to switch majors, and they have no influence on their admissions folks. Uh, and the University of Washington from 15% to 30%. So, and if one looks at what they all did, they did pretty similar things. So just as um, uh, an example of programs that have made a difference at getting more women into faculty positions, I want to talk about um, some things that have been done by the Computing Research Association's Committee on the Status of Women, which is known as CRAW. Um, so uh, one of the things they did was start the Distributed Mentor Program. And the idea was that many, C this was started back in about 1992, many uh, undergrad CS females would not have an opportunity to do undergraduate research with another female in the area they're interested in, because there's so few female faculty. And so they got NSF grants to match, to do a matching between female uh, computer scientists, academics, and undergraduate female students. And they did a study to show that um, students who participated in the DMP program were twice as likely to go on to PhD programs in computer science as those who participated in regular REU programs, research for undergraduates. Um, they have run for a number of years PhD cohorts where they take 250 female PhD students starting in the same year, and they bring them together once a year. They create a network, all that kind of stuff. They've done workshops for early academic success, so you know, for people who are postdocs or assistant professors, how to get your career started. They've done workshops for getting tenure. They've done workshops for pr promotion to full professor. So here's some of the evidence. Now, this is way too many figures, right? But um, the point is, so I took this all out of the Toby survey. And so I did the starting year as 2002, and my ending year is 2013. I did this uh, about uh, maybe eight months ago, and that was as far as you could get at that point. And so if you look at, so this is the female percentage of recipients of bachelor's degrees, PhD degrees, new faculty hired by computer science departments, the percentage of assistant professors, tenure track assistant professors who are female, percentage of associate professors, professors who are female, percentage of full professors. And one of the things you'll notice is you go down <coughs> every thing, you'll see that the percentage of people getting PhDs who are female is bigger than the percentage of people who got bachelor's degrees five years later. Same for new faculty. Same for assistant professors. Uh, same for associate professors. So it takes usually about six years to get to be an associate professor. Um, and same for full professors. So my, my claim is that what CRAW programs did, particularly the, the PhD cohort and the workshops for you know, learning how to be academically successful, um, they demystified the path to success. And it made a big difference because it meant that the percentage of women actually succeeding in academic careers was larger than the pipeline. So this is a pipeline that does not leak. This is a pipeline that has tributaries flowing in as we go along, and so the numbers get bigger. 
Okay, so let me talk about getting from 10% to 40% of HMC. And before I talk about that, I'm going to talk about, so, um, talk about how gender, okay, thank you. Oh, I can't do it that way. I have to do it this way. I'm so used to having a touch screen on my laptop that, okay. Hmm. Okay, this is a Mac. <laughs> it will not surprise you that given all the years I spent on the Microsoft board, I do not know how to uh, navigate a Bjorn. <laughs> what happened to my talk? What did you do? <laughs> okay, so I want to tell you a bit of. Thank you, thank you. OK. Well, I should have paid more attention so I would know. OK, so um, we started out as a co-ed institution from day one. Our founding president was married to a mathematician. And when the founding board said we should be a male um, institution because they're, who would want to marry a female mathematician? I take that personally. Uh, he said, I did. And, and so it was co-ed. Co-ed, though, until 1971, we had a cap on the percentage of students who could be female, which was 11%. <laughs> Why would you pick 11%? I don't know. OK, so by the time I arrived, so the previous president, John Strauss, was also very passionate about diversifying the student body and the faculty. And so it went from 22% in 97 to 32% when I arrived in 2006. Uh, Within four years, we're at 42 <laughs> percent. My God, I don't know. Okay, so let me learn now. Okay. Command tab. Okay, command tab. All right, good. 45 uh, percent in another two years, and 47 percent by 2014. Um, and now we we hover between you know 47 percent and 48 percent. Let me show you. So this is not CS. This is just the population as a whole. Uh, female faculty is about 20% in 97, about 33% in 2006, about 40% in 2010. And I'll go backwards. It hovers between 36% and 40% uh, because we're a very small place. We have about 90 faculty, a little bit less than that. And if we have a bunch of people retire and we hire a bunch of new people, it depends on the mix. Um, but you know, just compared Princeton, we celebrated when we got to 15% female in the um, engineering school while I was dean of engineering. Um, I don't know. What's the percentage of women faculty in EECS? It's like 13%. That's pretty good. <laughs> wow, that's really good. But it's not as good at MUD, where we have No, this is terrible. I actually don't. We have 13 faculty right this moment. I think we have six females. So, um, OK, so what did the computer science do? Now, I just want to say I get a lot of credit for this. I deserve a lot of credit for what happened. <laughs> now, just wait. What happened at the University of British Columbia? I led that effort. OK, this is how much credit I deserve for Harvey Mudd, because what happened at Harvey Mudd was really led by our CS faculty, and it was led by all the faculty in the department. Um, so what they did was, we have an intro course. It's called CS5. It's mandatory for every incoming MUD student unless you place out of it. Uh, they changed that course. They, I will say, eliminated macho student behavior. OK, so uh, I'm going to pick on Bjorn. Come on, Bjorn, come on up. <laughs> OK, so Bjorn is in my first year intro class. And Bjorn has been programming since he was 12. Okay. And, <laughs> and he didn't have a lot of CS courses in his high school because they weren't really, you know, there weren't a lot of them offered. But boy, he loves computer science. And he finally gets <laughs> into a computer science course at Harvey Mudd College. And there's a person teaching that course who actually knows something about computer science. So what does Bjorn do? Yes. 
He asks questions. He answers questions. He talks about all kinds of arcane things that 99% of the students have never heard of. And what happens to the other students in the class? <laughs> well, sad for Bjorn, yes. <laughs> but well, let me tell you, when I was programming assembly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> OK, so it makes most of the students in the class feel intimidated because he knows a ton, and he doesn't feel that, he knows, that they know as much. So here's what I do with Bjorn. I meet with Bjorn one-on-one -on -one out of class, and I say, Bjorn, I love having you in my class. You're one of the most passionate and, and, you know, about students I've worked with about computer science, and you know so much. You probably don't realize that just some of the other students in the class, they're scared because they don't know as much as you do. So if we could just have these conversations one-on-one -on -one in office hours, or maybe I could get you to work on a research project with me, that would be great. Is that okay? Yeah, that sounds great. It works. <laughs> now, you are saying, somebody here is saying, you can sit down. Thank you very much. Bjorn. <laughs> OK, somebody here is thinking, OK, I'm teaching a class with 1,500 first year students in it. How am I going to have that conversation? In fact, I met the person who was teaching my <laughs> class for lunch. Hi. You do it with your TAs your lab assistants, you know, you do it in the smaller sections that you're using. And you just make sure that it's respectful and appreciative and not a put down. It works. Okay. We took our first year female students to Hopper. So uh, somebody, Sheila maybe, was saying that you guys had 30 students at Hopper this year. We had 62. <laughs> no. <Nah. laughs> maybe it was only 52. But we have 800 students. You guys have some tens of thousands of students, not in computer science yet. Um, we provided summer researches, research experiences between the first and second year. And let me say a little bit more about what happened in that intro course. Well, our old course was, of course, introduction to fundamental concepts in computer science. <laughs> OK, I do cancel, and then I do command tab. Oh, oh no, that was a bad idea there. OK, thank you. Uh, but it was framed among the students as it's learning to program in Java. Our new course covers the same concepts. It's just as rigorous. In fact, it probably has more programming and coding than the old one had. But it is framed as computational approaches to creative problem solving using Python. OK, well, computer had to be in there someplace. That's computational approaches. The important part is creative problem solving. The creative part, which is not in my slide, uh, is important. Um, because there are very few young people who don't want to be seen as being creative. And if they're at a place like MUD, which is science and engineering school, they love problem solving. And then Python we use because it's more forgiving than C++ or C Sharp or Objective-C or Java. But also, it is used in industry. And so you take this course, and you can get a summer job. Um, we group by prior experience. So our colors are gold and black. I just want to demonstrate I'm wearing a Harvey Mudd t-shirt, um, which Harvey Mudd is one of the few places you could be president and wear t-shirt and jeans, let's say, 85% of the times. I mean, as a computer scientist, that is such a good thing. Um, OK, so we have CS5 gold and CS5 black. We also have CS42 and CS5 green. CS5 gold is for the students with no prior experience. CS5 black is for students with, say, an APCS course. And CS42 is for the students who are just way, you know, way too much computer science to put them in an intro course. So we put together. CS5 and the next course in our, uh, in our sequence, which is CS60. CS5 green is because we have a joint math CS bio major. And it's for students who would love to have all of the problems that they solve be motivated by biology. OK, and then as I mentioned, we got rid of natural behavior. Um, OK, so you know this is great, right? 
everybody loves it. It became uh, one of the most popular first, year, first semester courses that our students have to take. The number of majors tripled. Most of our non-majors, non-CS majors, want to take at least CS 5, 60, and 70. So CS 70, which used to be you know, a class that ran like 12 students in it per semester, it's capped at 120 now. And the demand is probably more like 200. Um, and then Claremont Colleges, five undergraduate colleges side by side, literally. Students get to take courses in all the other colleges. Hardly any students from the other colleges take mud classes until CS5. And it becomes one of the five most popular courses at the Claremont Colleges. And last year and this year, 60% of the students in CS5 are not from MUD. And then they want to take more courses. We have students from all the other colleges other than Pomona majoring in CS at MUD now. I mean, it's bananas. So it's wonderful, except, I mean, what do you do when you go from engineering, which used to be 40 to 55% of the majors, and CS, which used to be, let's say, uh, 10 to 15 percent of the majors, and now CS is the largest major. You can't just pick up faculty from one department and move them and say, hi, you're a chemist. Yeah, I'd really like to put you in CS now. It just doesn't work. <laughs> so, um, so our CS department, when we started this, had nine faculty, nine tenure-track faculty. They will have 14, so that's a growth of more than 50 percent. But um, it's it's still not nearly enough. Question? Yes. Do you have different faculty teach the scholars in CS5? Oh, they move around. Okay, but so it's not somebody re is responsible for both black and gold. The no, semester. typically not, because okay. there's a that's a lot of students. Yeah. Also, they're taught at the same time. So if you start out in black and you decide you'd like to move down to gold, you can, or vice versa, and therefore. At least in this universe, you can't have the same person teaching them. <coughs> um, so one of the things that I think of, and I think many people at Mud think of, is we're sort of this tiny little innovation lab. We're focusing on innovation in science and engineering undergraduate lab. And our idea is if we can prove that it's possible to do something, we'd like to share that with other institutions. And, and so, I mean, I know that Dan knows a ton about what we're doing at, um, and other people at Berkeley, because we have two, actually we have three of our faculty members who did their PhDs at Berkeley, and one of them did them with Dan, Colleen Lewis. Um, so we have something called a BRAID project, which I'll talk about in a moment. We have uh, Colleen Lewis developed, I believe, during her PhD, a scratch course, and uh, she's been offering it via edX with the idea that it's not for students to take the stretch course. It's for somebody, let's suppose you're a middle school teacher and you'd like to have a computer science course, but you don't really know much about computer science. Well, you could use the edX version. It provides all the slides, demos, uh, it grades all the exercise, all those kinds of things to actually offer it in your middle school or your high school. Uh, Obviously, I made the slide before fall 2015. We did a, a MOOC for profs uh, available, uh, which was available fall 2015, and I think it's running again this spring. And we are talking with Claremont McKenna, which is one of the other Claremont colleges whose students are mobbing our CS courses about developing what we're calling horizontal computer science. So if I'm an econ major and I want to take this is not true given the data science project that's happening here, but at most universities, if I want to take a machine learning course, I'm going to have to take a slew of courses in computer science before I get to machine learning. Now, many of the things in that, you know, like vertical uh, list of computer science courses, many of the things you wouldn't actually choose to teach if you knew you were teaching it for a biology major or an econ major. You're teaching it because you're making computer scientists. Um, and so the idea is, can we create curriculum that just after you've had your first course, you could take a machine learning course as your second course, where it would be focused on being able to apply the knowledge and skills 
in your discipline. So we're actually, there's, a, there's the first version of this course being taught by Zach uh, Dodds and Tuli Madero is being offered this semester and, and I'm going to be very interested to see what happens. So let me tell you about GRADE very quickly. So it stands for Building, Recruiting and Inclusion for Diversity. It's a collaboration by a whole bunch of places, but particularly uh, MUD, ABI, NCWIT, okay, Anita Borg Institute, okay, the HMC is MUD, uh, NCWIT is National Center for Women in Information Technology, CRA is Computing Research Association, CMDIT is Center for Minorities and Disabilities in IT, um, plus uh, 15 other CS departments, plus maybe about another 15 departments that are helping out and participating. It's funded by a bunch of, uh, of the usual suspects, and we have U UCLA research team studying the outcomes. So let me start, tell you how this came about. I was invited, uh, so CRA runs a work, uh, conference every two years in Snowbird, Utah for computer science department chairs. And they typically be have between 250 and 30, 300 department chairs there. I was asked to do a plenary on increasing diversity in computing. And so I, what I did was I showed uh, who led the, the uh, if I go back to the six uh, universities and, and colleges I was talking about, so um, you know, CMU, UBC, MIT, et cetera, I pointed out who was the leader at the time of the initiative to get more women to CS, how long it took, the approaches they used. And the key information about this is it was usually the department chair or a former department chair or somebody who in CMU was the associate dean for undergrad education, Alan Fisher, together with Jane Margolis, who's an anthropologist. Um, and pretty much the departments all did the same things. They changed their intro course, they uh, made efforts to build confidence and community among their s female students. They did outreach to high school teachers and students. And they, many of them, promoted joint majors with areas like biology and psychology and linguistics and cognitive science, where the majority of the majors are female. And, and so I just talked about this. And then towards the end of my talk, I said, the first 10 department chairs that want to lead an initiative like this at their, in their CS department, I will help you get funding to support some of these activities. Now, I had no money. <laughs> 15 people signed up before I finished my talk. Now, four of those went into my junk mail folder. So I had 11. <laughs> so I reached out to and they were all within a couple of minutes of each other, so I wasn't you know, like, going to differentiate in terms of timing. So I reached out to leaders at Facebook, Google, and Intel. And uh, sorry, Facebook, Google, and OK, so I can do that. All right. uh, Facebook, Google, and Microsoft. And I had a commitment of money within three days. Then I found, a week after that, I found the four other chairs so I reached out to Intel, and that took a little bit longer, but it worked fine. One of the companies said, you know, um, you should do, get a research team to be studying what's actually happening in those departments. And so I got, um, we gave, I, I recruited a team from UCLA on the advice of Jane Margolis, somebody named Linda Sachs, who's absolutely wonderful, and her um, student, Kate Lehman. And, um, we gave them a small amount of money per year. They applied for an NSF grant, and they got a $2 million grant to do a longitudinal study. So we were studying it to see what happens. OK. Um, in terms of strategies for recruiting and retaining female faculty, you guys probably know this. Educate search committees on best practices, spousal hiring programs, maternity leaves, parent-friendly department cultures, access to good child care, and provide backup care. Because one of the things we know is you know, if you have your kid in a preschool or other child care center where there are lots of kids, if they get sick, um, you don't have a lot of possibilities. So in terms of retaining more females in the tech careers and industry, there was a very interesting study published a number of years ago by the Anita Borg Institute. I think you can still read it off their website. Um, 
Google brought a thousand female engineers to Hopper this year. Microsoft bought, brought 800. I mean, Copper had 12,000 attendees. It sold out within five days. I mean, it's, yeah, so, uh, and work with companies to get a commitment to change their culture, which is certainly something I've been working on with a number of companies. Okay, increase the visibility. Dan, this is for you. Okay, that is David Bly's daughter, Ramona. <laughs> For those of you who know David, when she was, I don't know, maybe about 18 months old. Um, you know, I think if you're a female in a department or, you know, a company where there aren't a lot of women, it gets really annoying to be the only person who questions why there are so few female faculty, why are there so few <coughs> keynote speakers, female keynote speakers, why are there are so few summer in female summer interns, why are there so few few female board members, so ask. And everyone should be talking about the importance of having more women in tech. So I was told to end early enough that we would have lots of time for questions and discussion. And uh, I'd be happy to answer questions. Bjorn has a mic. Yeah, thank you. All right, if you raise your hand, I will bring the mic to you. All right, first out of the gate. Hi. Hi. Um, so I know this is probably not your area of expertise, but what lessons can we take from this to improve racial diversity, which I think if you look at this room, oh, is probably yes, worse yes. than Thank you. gender Thank diversity. You. So um, in case you couldn't tell, I care really deeply about racial diversity. And um, so, so let me... Uh, when I arrived at Harvey Mudd, between 1% to 2% of the students were African-American or biracial with one parent African-American. About 5% of the students were Hispanic. About 1% were Native American or Pacific Islander. And about 5% were international students. And um, we made a lot of progress, as I showed, on gender in the first five years or so. And we were working so hard on African-American and Hispanic students. And we were making very little progress. And then, um, so we did a bunch of things. First of all, we tried to really understand why African-American and Hispanic students were not choosing to come. And our top four schools that we compete with are, uh, in some order, MIT, Stanford, Caltech, and Berkeley. And then after that, it's you know some mix of Princeton, Harvard, Yale, and Cornell. Occasionally CMU, occasionally Rice, but um, the the top four really are are those. And uh, what we found out from the research we were doing is Hispanic students are much more likely their families want to stay close to home, so we needed to focus our recruiting closer to home rather than across the country for Hispanic students. For African-American students, um, they want to go to the best known institution that they get into. And at the time we started doing this, you know, trying to evaluate why we were having so much difficulty, um, we were not well known at all. And so for that one, we did a number of things, but it involved one, I went and met with African-American leaders across the country, African-American leaders in science and engineering, and asked them to talk about Harvey Mudd within their communities. But I also reached out to a couple of people who have much better um, media presence than I do, uh, Cheryl Sandberg and Megan Smith, and asked them to talk about Harvey Mudd. And I, that was, those two things made a huge difference. So then we started to get at least a few more applications. Now, I've already mentioned Colleen Lewis. The first year that she's at Harvey Mudd, brand new assistant professor. Now we had managed to admit more African American Hispanic students because we'd gotten more applications because of the other work we were doing. So after we sent out the acceptances, Colleen sends out a message to all of our faculty saying, be really nice to have faculty members individually contact students of color who've been admitted to Mudd. Within 24 hours, 
a quarter of our faculty signed up to do it. And in fact, way more than a quarter were involved in doing it. We went from our incoming class that year went to, so one to two percent African American, went to six. Uh, five to six, five percent or so Hispanic went to 10 or 11. And now, w what problem do you think this caused for us? Our yield went way up. So we were aiming for 196 students and we had 219. <laughs> the same faculty that made those phone calls and sent emails accused uh, us of it being our fault. <laughs> it's like, oh, give me a break. But they were happy about the diversity. Next year, it stayed, they did the same things. We also, uh, Colleen organized, also reaching out to first gen, generation college students. Okay. This year, our incoming class is 13% African American or biracial with one parent African American, 20% Hispanic. There's probably at least one kid that is being counted twice. 3.5% uh, Native American Pacific Islander, mostly Pacific Islander. 14% uh, international. So that's more than 50% already. Um, and uh, yeah, and so I didn't even mention Asians. That's another 22% or something. I mean, it's just, it is a really diverse class and it is wonderful. So now, you know, these are very early days. We have to prove we can actually support them so that they graduate. And I don't think there's any particular reason why they'll be differently distributed among majors than, than our current, you know, previous classes, but we'll have to see. So we also, um, so we think of um, diversity very broadly. So we have students with disabilities. We have a deaf student who's a junior this year in engineering. We have, I mean, and just remember, we have 800 students. We have a student who is uh, legally blind who graduated in, I believe, engineering two years ago. Um, we have uh, at least a couple of transgender students in every incoming class. Uh, we have a very active cohort of gay, lesbian students. Um, and we've also managed to really um, significantly diversify our faculty as well. It's not where we want it to be yet, but we've made a lot of progress. So yeah, we care about that too. Um, you talked a little bit before about uh, the restrictions uh, big public institutions face in recruiting um, women in CS. I was just wondering if you or some of the professors here knew what those restrictions are. Uh, so let me talk about um, what I know about Berkeley and what I know about um, other public things. So first of all, Berkeley admits get students into the CS major in two ways. One is that they can apply to EECS. Um, and the percentage of, of students coming in uh, who are going to major in CS is pro that are female is probably about 13%. And the reason is that m most young women in high school don't think that CS is something that they would be good at or would be interested in. So then, actually, a much, so that's 350 students per year. And so until we manage to get more exposure to computer science in a, a more sort of supportive, creative problem solving framework into high schools, we're, we're probably, that number of 13% may go up slightly, but it's not likely to get to 30%. On the other hand, um, Berkeley also admits students to the CS major through letters in science, um, and that's, they have a much higher percentage of women coming in because we now have at Berkeley, I believe, 1,500 students in the introductory computer science course. The percentage that's female is about 40 percent in that uh, course. between 30 and 40. Yeah, it, right. So you know, it's on. It's it's between 30 and 45 percent. Thank you very much. And and so if you have a course, which I that's a wildly popular course and has been growing in popularity, that is not intimidating and you know, is very supportive and engaging, you have a chance to convince students 
and, and that's going to generally have a much broader population of women, you have a chance to convince those students to take the next course in the sequence. And then you've got a chance to convince them to take the next one and eventually to become a CS major. So the, the things that influence uh, large public universities tend to be the percentage of students you're admitting directly to the major, because that's if you direct, admit directly to the major, that's always going to be disproportionately male. And the percentage of students that you can actually attract through convincing students who are in, thought they were going to major in biology, psychology, um, cognitive science, linguistics, all areas that are, that, you know, are more than 50% female in the major, if you can convince them either to do a joint major or to at least take your, the introductory course reasonably early on, you have a good shot at attracting them. So the other constraints for large public universities is um, budget constraints. And so you know, one of the, virtually every public university system has been, going, has been receiving a lot less funding per student than they did, say, 20 years ago or even 10 years ago. And so the flexibility that you have to respond to changes in demand is constrained. And, and so, you know, just like Harvey Mudd, the number of people majoring in computer science has risen really dramatically here and at most other institutions. And so one of the issues is that uh, many public universities have to put grade caps. And, and if you put a grade cap on entry into a major, even for women who perform above the grade cap, women on average underestimate their performance compared to men. And so if you have a barrier to entry, it's more likely to adversely affect women, even if they're over the edge. By the way, I should ask, did I get that right in terms of the constraints for Berkeley? I'm looking at people who actually know. Oh, yeah, Prop 8, yes. Yeah, hi, thank you. Um, I'm wondering uh, what your relationship is with those other departments from which students are coming. Have you been able to show that the students coming to your CS program are able to make contributions in their respective fields or to take that the skills back to their departments in some way? That is a very, uh, a very insightful question. <laughs> so. Um, you know, I think a lot, so a lot of the chairs of other departments think that it's because we admitted a lot of women and other students who wanted to major in computer science. In fact, so students, when they apply to MUD, they can indicate what they think they're going to major in. They don't have to, but they mostly do. And so we have been deliberately over admitting people who want to major in chemistry, biology, physics because those are the departments who have fewer majors at the moment. Math is still doing OK. Um, engineering is still doing fine. It's down from what it used to be. And so the problem is that, so we, so it used to be that um, even when we had 40% of our CS majors being female, we were getting, we were admitting maybe two female students a year who were interested in majoring in computer science. But I, I think there's a number of things that are influencing students' choices. So one is um, that intro course is very, I mean, I meet so many students in their first year who say, I hate computers, but I love CS5. It's so much fun. It's my hardest course. It's so much fun. <laughs> it's like, right. So it's partly that, but it's also, it's the job market. I mean, you look at the fact that you know, starting salaries for a bachelor's degree in computer science from Harvey Mudd uh, last year were between 100 and 110 k. Um, we had one guy, uh, like three years ago, who got a salary starting salary of 280 k. Now he was going oh. into finance, and he'd done a you know who it is, right? <laughs> <laughs> he he'd done a summer internship at a, a, a finance place in Chicago, and he made them a million dollars. So I. I think they thought it was cheap to, <laughs> to hire him at 280k. But you know, there's the fact that you know, if we have a hundred companies coming to a career fair, 
probably 80% of them are looking for CS majors. Now, you know, we get complaints from students saying, why aren't you getting engineering or chemistry or, well, this is a job market. But there's no question that um, there's, there's concern and to a certain degree resentment from some of the other departments. Um, just because, you know, it doesn't help that I'm a female computer scientist mathematician. You sort of go like, I'm sure she did it. I'm absolutely sure she did it. She told those admissions people just to admit. People want to do that. Um, and, it, and it's very hard, even though we've got lots of data to show otherwise, it's, it's, it's hard for people who are in other departments not to feel that you know, somehow the world is tilting towards computer science. And the world is tilting towards computer science. I mean, <laughs> it's just true. I'd like to know something. Um, I moved from San Diego to New York, and I didn't have any contacts in New York. And I, I'm a UCSD alumni, and I went to the UCSD alumni and did a big workshop to get a job there. You know, yeah. you need contacts there. I wish the colleges would extend more than just having a UC alumni in some state and not participate. I think you're doing a wonderful job at MUD. I wish you would keep in touch with your female students or even just alumni period who've moved on and just make sure they're tight or to where we can network within each other really, really tightly and help each other. Yeah, so that's a great point. Um, so there's a student who graduated, um, I think in 2012, and she's currently working for you know a, a fairly large and successful startup. And um, and she recently contacted us and said she would like to get involved in doing some mentoring at MUD, and I was thrilled. But then uh, John Jacobson, who, so raise your hand if you're a MUD alum here. We have a few, I know. Yes, okay. I, I know all three who are here. <laughs> yeah, so um, the, uh, John Jacobson, who's a math prof at MUD, who everyone here knows, and who's now our Dean of Students and Vice President for Student Affairs. You may not know that. Uh, but he sent me a copy of a blog that she po published. And so, she's, and so she's writing about her experience. And she's talking about the fact that virtually every female she knows working in tech and startups is just waiting to get out. And she's wondering how long she's going to stay there. Now, this is somebody who graduated from MUD in three and a half years. Now, that's like very, very unusual, incredibly talented. And yet, she's already feeling like, and, and the way she phrases it is, why would you want to stay in a place where people really don't want women engineers? And I have heard that a lot, and I'm really worried about it. I mean. You know, I think, so there, there's a bunch of initiatives that are going on. Obviously, uh, the Hopper Conference is designed to, uh, to do something about that, to help people build connections. Um, I know I was, I was talking with Sue Jay earlier, and she was talking about her Women's Leadership Roundtable. Um, uh, Cheryl Sandberg has been doing all of these things about lead-in circles, but we need to do more. I mean. So, so yeah, we do alumni events. Uh, this is our 60th anniversary, so we've been doing 60th anniversary celebrations all over the country, still continuing. Um, and you, you know, we've we got to figure this out because I mean, it just breaks my heart that we have women who do so well in areas like computer science, physics, math, engineering, and then go out into careers and all the effort that everyone has put into, and not just women, African Americans and Hispanic students and ev everybody who's an underrepresented minority, that they've done so well, they're so talented, and they enter environments that are at the very least not supportive and at the worst really genuinely hostile. So, you know, we're not done. I mean, this is why this is something everyone needs to work on. So one of the things we started in Seattle was um, Cheryl Sandberg runs a, it's called Women in S of Silicon Valley Dinner Series in her house. And 
um, she has honored guests, and she, I don't know if she, after the death of her husband if she's still doing them, maybe not, but she had been doing them for probably at least six years, and she'd have about 50 or 60 people, an honored guest, she'd interview the honored guest, and then have uh, the women who are there have a chance to have a dialogue with the honored guest. And I was asked to help start a series like this in um, Seattle. We did it four years ago. Uh, we run it four times a year. Now that I'm off the Microsoft board, one of the other uh, female board members, Terry Listoll, is taking over my role as the, I was the default interviewer. Um, we're starting a series like this with Caltech um, this spring. Um, just things that can give women a chance to get encouragement, to build a network where, uh, you know, one of the other things I do, and I was talking to Sylvia about this today, is um, I very deliberately do um, phone mentoring. And it's uh, for all kinds of people, and mostly women. David Bly is one of the few men that I, I mentor. Um, and you know, somebody was asking, well, what you do? And I say, well, they just email me when there's an issue that they want to just get advice on. And then um, I do most of my painting on weekends, and usually I like to be talking on the phone to somebody while I'm painting, and so I, it makes me feel like I'm doing something really worthwhile with the time I'm spending painting. And uh, <laughs> it also helps me learn an enormous amount about the issues that women, and a few men, are going through at all stages in their career. So, and one of the reasons I'm doing this is I think about this as an inverse pyramid. I know for sure that almost everyone I do this with is starting to reach out to people around them to do similar things for them. And you know, I, you just think about exponential growth. And you know, if everyone did this for ten people, we'd be pretty good. <laughs> so. So yeah, there's lots of work to do. It's not done yet. But, um, but the good news is making progress is not that hard. It just takes persistent commitment. And it takes, you can't just leave it to one or two people in a department to be working on it. You have to collectively say, yeah, this is something we care about. Even if I'm only going to do, you know, spend 5% of my time on it, I'm going to spend 5% of my time on it. So thank you very much. It's a joy to be with you as always at Berkeley. Thank you.